Okay, so let me first say that I need another CNC router like I need a hole in the head. So of course I'm going to build another one. A couple of months ago, I sold my 4x4 Avid CNC to my good friend Melinda, whose shop is about 20 minutes from me. I got a fair price for it, and I really didn't think I would miss it. And at first, I didn't. But then the seller's remorse started to set in, and I was thinking about the projects that were going to be too big or at least much more difficult to run with my old Sidewinder CNC with a small cutting area of 40 inches by 26 inches that you see pictured here. Then one day in early April, I was out in my shop and I stumbled across the old 4x4 Sidewinder machine frame that I built my Gatton CNC on. I designed it about 17 years ago and it was designed to use NEMA 23 stepper motors and Acme lead screws. Although it was a solid design, it was just way too slow for my liking, so I never used it until I built my Gatton CNC on the table and frame of it. I disassembled the Gatton CNC about three years ago and stashed the metal frame under a workbench in my shop and kind of forgot about it. But since I found it again, I started wondering if I could design a new machine around that old Sidewinder 4x4 frame using linear rails and bearings, ball screws instead of lead screws, and use the NEMA 34 motors and drivers that I've had sitting around for a few years. I got the frame parts out from under my workbench, but before I assembled them, I had to get rid of that butt ugly green color, so I headed to Ace Hardware to get some spray cans of one of my favorite colors, Machine Tool Gray. After about three coats, I assembled the freshly painted frame and I was ready to get going on this project. I ordered two sets of 15 millimeter linear guide rails and bearings and two 15 millimeter 1605 ball screws. I already had some holes for my old rail system lasered into the sides, but I wanted to mount the new linear rails a little bit higher. So I made a couple of jigs to screw into the existing holes and proceeded to transfer punch to mark where the new holes would go. After all the holes were drilled and tapped for an M5, I slid the bearings back onto the rails and installed the rails to the side of the machine. After the linear rails and bearings were installed on the Y-axis sides, I used my old CNC to cut some uprights out of half-inch plywood so I could mock, mock up the X-axis and get an idea how long my X-axis gantry would be. After I had figured out what I would need for my uprights, I ordered a couple of pieces of 1 half inch by 8 inch by 24 inch aluminum bar from Metals Depot and used my CNC to cut them to length and then laid out the holes using my Precision Matthews milling machine. While I was working on the uprights, the aluminum extrusion that I ordered from the 8020 company in Indiana came in. It's a 1500 millimeter piece of 80 millimeter by 160 millimeter T-slotted profile. With the aluminum uprights installed, I was able to get the accurate measurement that I needed to cut the aluminum extrusion. I was a little worried initially about cutting it with my old Ryobi 12 inch miter saw because this is some really beefy stuff. So I triple checked my measurement, clamped it to my miter saw, and cut through it slowly. The cut came out perfectly and I was so relieved because that is a very expensive piece of aluminum and I didn't want to mess it up. After cutting the extrusion, I tapped the eight holes in each end for an M8 screw. Since I was going to use slide-in T-nuts to mount the linear guide rails to the extrusion, I couldn't put the extrusion between the uprights until I cut the rails. And since that material is hardened, I bought a pack of diamond cutting discs for my angle grinder. I had to shorten each rail approximately 100 millimeters, or about 4 inches, and since I wanted to keep the hole spacing equal, I had to make two cuts to each rail 
cutting roughly two inches off of each end. The diamond wheel worked pretty well and I was able to get the burrs cleaned up with a grinding wheel. Once I got the linear rail slid into the extrusion, I realized it would be much easier to install the Z-axis mounting plate to the guide bearings with the extrusion laying flat because there are two spacer plates that have to go between the plate and the guide bearings to make room for the ball screw nut. The aluminum extrusion weighs about 42 pounds by itself, so now it's quite a bit heavier with the parts I've added. I had to use lots of scrap wood to block this up a little at a time until I got the holes to line up on the uprights. Next, it was time to add some new holes to my 2.2 kilowatt spindle mount to match the holes on the Z-axis assembly that I purchased online. With all the mechanical parts assembled, it was time to start working on the control box. I used some scrap half inch plywood to build a box 24 inches wide by 20 inches tall by 9 inches deep and I put a cleat on the back so it will hang on the left side of the machine frame. I designed a bracket to mount the power supplies in Design Spark Mechanical that allows me to stack them and have them offset a little so I can get to the terminal screws. For this build, each motor will have its own power supply. I'm using three NEMA 34 motors with DM860T drivers for the X and Y axis and will use a 0 to 60 volt power supply running around 50 volts. For the Z axis, I'm using a NEMA 23 motor with a DM542T driver and a 0 to 48 power supply running around 36 volts. Unlike most of the CNC builds I've done before where I've used Mach 3 as a control software, I'm going to use a Gen 2 Masso controller with this machine. I used my Ohmtech CO2 laser to make this shallow box that is mounted to a single arm monitor mount. The monitor is a touchscreen, but the Masso controller only works with certain touchscreen monitors and unfortunately it doesn't work with this one. That's why I have a Bluetooth keyboard mounted above the monitor. Here is a look inside the box of the Masso second generation controller. It's powered by a 12 volt power supply and that DB25 breakout board you see is connected to the other DB25 breakout board that's in the big control box so that you don't have to bring a bunch of wires to the Masso. You just use a DB25 cable that makes it a much cleaner install. The machine is alive and working exactly as it should. I have the spindle mounted, but I have not run the cable through the drag chain as of yet. If you look on the wall behind the machine, you can see the VFD mounted there. When I disassembled the GATT and CNC, I just took the cable off and coiled it up and hung it on the VFD, so connecting the spindle will be an easy task. I have a piece of 3 quarter inch plywood on the machine bed and a piece of 3 quarter inch MDF on top of that for my spoil board. I have not attached either of those yet as I'm still undecided as to what I want to use to hold material down. Usually I use several row, rows of T-Track with strips of MDF in between them, but I want to try something different on this machine. Leave me a comment below if you have any suggestions for a spoil board and hold down system and let me know what you're using for your CNC machine. Also, if you have any questions about why or how I did something on this build, leave a comment below. I try to read all the comments and reply to them promptly. I will be adding some proximity sensors for homing switches as soon as they are delivered and I will be using my Precision Matthews milling machine to make another touch probe plate. I will also be shopping for a tool setter soon. If you enjoyed this video please leave it a thumbs up and that will make the YouTube algorithm gods happy. If you're not subscribed to this channel and want to see what I make with this machine, hit the subscribe button and turn on the notifications so you'll know when I upload a new video. Until the next one, thank you very much for watching.